Hello, congregation. Welcome once again to another bone-crushing edition of the Boneyard. Grab your Bible. We're going through our awesome series of Romans. We're picking up here in Romans chapter 7. And anybody who knows music, knows, of course, that melody is a, it's a, it's a teaching, it's a, it's a tool that you have to hone and understand. Melody is remembering the tune before and after a certain tune that you hear. Because at any given time, you only hear one tune at a time. So the story of redemption, the, the music box of redemption, the song of redemption, like it says in Zechariah, where Jesus sings over us. It's found right here in Romans. So starting in Romans chapter 7 where we're picking up, grab your Bible, something to write on and something to write with. I guarantee you, you will learn something today. We're going to pick up in Romans chapter 7. Now many scholars, many people try to say that Romans chapter 7 kind of is flipped and dropped and plopped right in the middle of this theolog theological book. Now some people may, may argue that this is where Paul is trying to teach that you can be a carnal Christian. Well, you can, you can be a Christian and still struggle in the world, that you can be a disciple and not really follow after Jesus. Is that really what Paul is teaching? Is that really what Paul is talking about? Is there such thing as a carnal Christian? See, this, the story begins in chapter 1, but if we read to 14 to 25 in chapter 7, Paul puts the word I in there. It talks about his experiences. That means we could say that Paul was a carnal Christian? Was he an apostle that struggled with the world and had struggled in issues? He had problems. And is that really what Paul is saying? Because Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Is that what Paul is telling us to be, carnal Christians? Well, maybe we should dive into the word. See, chapter 6 carries right into chapter 7. Sanctification is in chapter 6, 7. As Paul deals with his sanctification, before in chapter 6, he deals with justification. Sanctification, now in chapter 8, he'll deal with glorification. So let's dive into this beautiful melody of redemption, of God redeeming his people. So let's begin with the tune before chapter 7. Let's go to chapter 6, verse 14, and we're going to expound on what Paul is teaching here. So in chapter 6, verse 14, for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. This is Paul teaching for the Christian, for those in the congregation who believe in Jesus, who are disciples of Christ. You are not under the dominion of sin. You've changed realms. You're not under sin, but under grace. Now, Paul is getting ready to expound on that in chapter 7. So turn there with me really quick in chapter 7, verse 1. Let's follow along as the Apostle Paul teaches us. Beginning in verse 7, four, verse 1, verse, chapter 7, verse 1. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person as long as he lives. Notice, in our natural world, we don't have any laws on the book for any dead people. Once you are executed as a convict, maybe capital punishment, there is no, no new laws that you are, are to be locked up for anything. You are dead. This is what Paul was telling us, that a person is binding on, under the law as long as he lives. Notice in verse 2, Thus a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Now, Paul was not teaching us here about marriages. He really hits that hard in 1 Timothy and Titus. He even talks about it in 1 Corinthians 7, 8, and 9. He talks about um, life after divorce. He talks about remarriage. So Paul's focus here is not about marriage. This is nothing more than an analogy. Paul was teaching us here that a woman is bound to her husband as long as he's alive. Notice, Boneyard, that many in the congregation tonight, you used to be bound by sin because you were basically married to it. It had dominion over you. See, Boneyard, I can speak from experience because I was bound to sin. I was bounded under it by law. It ruled over me. As we continue in verse 3, accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law and she marries another. She is not an adulteress. Notice here, Boneyard, Paul was teaching us here, if you're bound, if you're bound, notice though, Christians are not bound under sin. We are dead to sin because we look in verse 6, chapter 6, verse 14, 
we will have no have sin not have dominion over us. We are not under law, but under grace. Paul was using an analogy. Those of us in the congregation who used to be married to pornography, those who used to be married to uh, adultery, those who used to be married to gossip, those who used to be married to self-righteousness, covetousness, those who used to dishonor the Sabbath thing, you were married to those things. They had dominion over you. You couldn't help but enjoy those things. Listen, Boneyard, the Christian, the disciple, the one who's forsaking the world, who's taking up his cross and following Jesus, does not have sin dominion, have dominion over him anymore. He is married to Christ, like it says in Colossians 3, 3, you are dead in Christ. So if you are dead in Christ, you live through him. Notice when sin knocks at the door. Whenever the door is open, they don't even notice you because you're a new creature in Christ. You're a new creature and new features, like it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The sin looks you up and down and says, whoa, whoa, I was, I was looking for Kevin. Who, who are you? Now, now we continue in verse 4. Likewise, my brother, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ. Notice the Bible teaches us that God takes the ordinances and the law and nails it to the cross so that we can live through Christ. As we continue also, so that you may, may belong to another we are not married to sin anymore. We're dead to sin. We're not under holy or unholy matrimony with sin. We're under righteousness now. We are the bride of Christ. As this rich, rich theology soaks deep into your bones, boneyard congregation, pay attention. Let it be good news to you that you can be a Christian and still struggle with sin. But how do you deal with everyday sin, Christian? How do you deal with the, the issues that come along in your life? You should say, well, I don't have to deal with this anymore. I'm a Christian now. I, I shouldn't have any more sin. But what about what it says in John that he who practices sin is not of God? What about... What about I'm supposed to be holy as he is holy? How do I deal with everyday sin? Well, Paul is getting ready to address that as we continue along here. To him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. Notice when you are bound under sin, the only choices and the only free will you have as a, a bond servant under sin is nothing but sin and sin. You can choose. You can choose all you want, but all your choices are are sin. You are bound to it. You're a slave to sin. As we continue in verse 5, For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to, what, to that which has held us captive, so that we may not serve, not under the old written code, but under the new life of the Spirit See, many people will take this verse out of context. They'll pull it out and they'll make a tastropy, a, a quilt of theology where they'll say that they are free to sin, that they have a license to sin, that they're allowed to sin, that they're under grace. But it seems they forgot about chapter 6, that we should sin, that grace should abound. Paul tells us, God forbid. Notice that the Christian doesn't want to do that. I'll ask you, Boneyard. If you're like me, you're married and you, you love your wife. But if I went to my wife and said, baby, I love you. I, I care for you so much. But if I were to cheat on you, would you forgive me? And she'll say, of course, baby, I love you. You're just a fallen man and fallen creation. I have to learn to live out the gospel even in our relationship. Of course, I'll forgive you. Then I'll say, baby, before you even finish those words, I'll be right back. And then I go cheat on her. Did I really love her? Notice. God takes the gospel, he takes the laws, the Ten Commandments, and he writes them on fleshly hearts. He takes the stony hearts that we had before we re regenerated and changes us. He changes us. Notice to the unbeliever, the Ten Commandments are burdensome because everything they read, that they said, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, they want to do. It awakens the sin in them. They want to touch. They want to taste the forbidden fruit. They want those things. However, they need a new heart. That's when God reaches down to man, takes out his heart of stone, and puts in a heart of flesh. The reason it's a heart of flesh is so it can feel the warmth of his hand on that heart. He changes that heart. He makes them desire him. Notice that a man cannot get to heaven by good works. He can't be perfect. So God will not judge us by our works. He gives us the ability to turn to him and chase after him because we cannot do it on our own. It's sola fide, faith alone. Sola gratia, sola grace, grace alone. As we continue here, 
It's the law of the Spirit. Notice it's not the letter of the law anymore. It's not under the Christian. We don't, he, it's not the, the Ten Commandments. It's the law written on our heart that God writes on our hearts with his own finger. He puts a new spirit within us. Like he says in Jeremiah 33, in verse 31 through 32, he puts a new spirit within us. He sprinkles clean water on us. He changes our heart. Maybe you're thinking this Christian thing is so hard. It's, it's burdensome. But you're not remembering what Jesus said. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. God doesn't put more on us than we can carry and bear. God changes our hearts and allows us to do good works like he teaches us in Ephesians. And not only does he give us the, the ability to go, do good works, he rewards us when we do. St. Augustine called this the crowning of his gifts. God blesses us when we do the good works that he gave us the ability to do. That's where sola gratia comes in, the grace that belongs. The sola gratia is grace alone. Sola de glory is God alone gets the glory. So when I am blessed to do good works for him because I am changed, I give him glory because only someone like Jesus can save someone like me. So, Bonya, let us continue in verse 7 as we read here the law of sin. As Paul talks about in verse 7, what then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. See, the, the fault is not with the law. The fault is within our own, own heart. As Paul teaches here in verse 7, yet it had not been for the law. I would not have known sin. I would have not known what it was to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. Notice Paul, he had to, had to, had his sin opened. Notice a dark room cannot show its contents unless light is thrown into that room. The darkness of man, like it says in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart above all things is deceitful. Who can know it? It's not until the gospel of Jesus Christ, when the doors are open and the windows and the shades are pulled back, that we can see the dirt in that room of our hearts. We can see the dirty, dirty, dirty mounds of self-righteousness, the cesspool of pride. We can see those things once the gospel starts illuminating into into our lives. Paul here is telling us he wouldn't even know what covetousness was until he saw the law says, Thou shalt not covet. As we continue, verse 8, But sin seized an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. Notice many pulpits don't preach the law of the, God, the, law of the gospel anymore. Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, taught many times that you need to preach 99% law because man is quick to justify himself. Yes, I'm a good person. See, man lean, leans toward self-righteousness always. Occasionally, you'll come across someone whose heart is ready for the gospel. That You cannot earn your way to heaven, but it's only by the merit of Jesus Christ, the merit of another, Jesus Christ. So until then, we have to kill them under the law like Paul is teaching us here. Verse 9, I was once alive apart from the law, but now when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. Notice Paul here as he's breaking down this word. He says, I was alive apart from the law. He was alive under sin. But when I came, the commandment came, sin came alive Notice that sin wasn't dormant and dead. He was mainly under the realm. He did not notice it until it was illuminated. Now imagine Paul. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He kept God's commandments. He kept the law. And that inbred self-righteousness. He was proud. As we can read about how the, the people who were stoning Stephen threw their coats down at his feet. He was the Pharisees of Pharisees. He studied the law. He went to the best schools. Notice Paul here. He, he was left and to, allowed to incubate his self-righteousness, his, his own works will get him into heaven. That's why he despised the Christians. That's why he hated them, because the Christians were leaning upon the everlasting arms of Jesus Christ, hoping and praying on the merit of Jesus, upon the, the works and the merit of another. See, Paul, he despises. Notice religious people despise grace, because they're, they have to give up. What the, 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 the dead works in their hands that they believe will get them to heaven, the dirty rags, the twigs and the dirt, fistfuls of dirt that they think will get them to heaven. 
What greater way to insult God is to give him fistfuls of dirty rags and trophies that are nothing more than twigs and dead dry bones to say, is this good enough to get into heaven? Paul is telling us here, he knows what it's like to be religious. Boneyard, I know what it's like to be religious. I understand about this treadmill of works mentality that my good works will get me to heaven. See, it's like a scale, Boneyard. If I sin here, well, maybe if I come over here and do good works, they, the scale would balance that God will overlook my sin because I do good works. Maybe if I help in children's church and I shake hands at the door and at my church every day or I take up the offering and volunteer at my, my, my church or my local community center, that he'll overlook my pride, the cesspool of lust, the pornography, the adultery, the gossip. Maybe he'll overlook these things if I cover them with my own good works. That is the very definition of religious people. Boneyard, I know about religious people. Boneyard, I understand how you think. But at the moment you realize that your good works and dirty rags are an offense, they're a stench in his nostrils, that you are standing on your own good merit, that you believe your own good works will get you to heaven, that it offends God. Because you are trotting the cross of Christ underfoot. That you're pushing it down and says, No, I'll get to heaven by my good works. Not what he did. I'm not justified by his sacrifice. I'll get to heaven because of what I do. You are offending God. You need to examine your heart. Your heart, like he says in Second Peter, examine your heart to make sure you're in the faith. Because many of us ministers, we have, we have all kinds of mistresses. No, we don't go out and sleep around. But many of us are more faithful to the ministry and let our family die on the altar of ministry. We're more faithful to ministry than we are even to God. We love and worship the church and ministry more than God. We are religious. See, someone like me, I'm speaking your language. I hope you're, you're smelling what I'm cooking. I hope you're picking up what I'm smacking down. I know religious people because I was a religious person. And that's what Paul was telling us here as we continue here in verse 9. No, 10. The very commandment that promised life proved to me death. Notice Paul here. He could have kept every one of the Ten Commandments. He could have honored the Sabbath, honored the, the, the Sabbath day, honored his mother and his father, not covet. He could have not lusted, swore over his eyes like Job did, that he would not lust but it only brought forth death because as he kept those commandments, as he looked the part, inside pride would grow. If we're left to our own devices, boneyard, self-righteousness, when cesspool of, of pride would swell up in us and we look down at other people, notice Jesus died for the religious and the rebellious. It's not just sinners We can't line up people and say, well, he's a sinner because he has tattoos and he has gauges in his ears. Oh, he has an addiction. We can't pick a sinner out of a lineup because we're all sinners. Like it says in chapter 3, there is none who chase after God. Notice, Boneyard, we all tend to be religious or rebellious. So let us continue here in verse 12. So that the holy law and the commandment of holy and the righteous and the good did that which is good. Then bring forth death to me by no means. Boneyard, Paul was telling us here that the law is not at fault. It's our own hearts. He's saying here something that is good, which is God's requirements to get to heaven, which are the Ten Commandments. These are not at fault. It is our own heart. It is sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be brought to be sin and through the commandment might be become sinful beyond measure. Boneyard, ministers in the congregation, youth pastors, children's workers, make sure you're illuminating the gospel to the people who are under you. Make sure you're using the law because religious people like myself and rebellious people are resistant to it. Only when we have the room open. Imagine uh, you dusting your living room, making sure it's clean, 
but you do it with the shades pulled. But when you pull back the shades, you'll see the places that you missed. You'll see whole streaks of places. No one cleans in the dark. No one makes sure that the lights are off when they're cleaning. We need the gospel to illuminate. We need the law to show us the faults of our hearts, to show us our covetousness, our, our, our idols, our gossip. We need those things. The gospel has teeth when you use the law. And Paul is telling us here that sin has become exceedingly sinful. Notice we always justify our gossip. It's not gossip. It's just a prayer chain, brother. Let me call you and tell you about Sister Snotgrass. Tell you what she's going through so we can pray together. No, you're gossiping. Notice whenever the gospel is preached, the law needs to come first. Other, other than that, the gospel is not good news. It's nonchalant. Oh, Jesus died for my sins. Great. I'm not really that bad of a sinner. We need the law like Paul tells us. Verse 14, For we know that the law is... Spiritual, but I am of the flesh. Now, Boneyard, Paul drops down in a different gear here. He starts talking about himself. Now, many people argue from 14 to 25 that Paul was talking about carnal Christians, but Paul was actually talking about himself. If you're in the congregation tonight, you can relate to what Paul's talking about the struggle to do righteous works, but still have to deal with everyday sin. Still have to deal with addictions that still haunt your life. Still deal with people in your life that invoke you to sin. Still deal with issues that you believe that should be long dead and buried. Why does God allow his people to still deal with sin? Why well, won't you imagine, remember the story of Joshua as they entered the promised land. Moses has died. Now they're going into the promised land. However, God could have gone ahead of them and wiped out the inhabitants of the land. He could have gone in and killed and wiped out every ite, the Jebuites, the Moites, the, all these different ites, these different cities, the Jerichos, the, 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 all these different cities that were rising up against Israel. He could have done that, but why didn't he? Because the children of Israel are just like us. We would get arrogant and think it's about us. We will think... Oh, well, I've got this. I've got it under control. I'm working this thing out. I'm doing this. I'm doing it. I'm grinding it out. I'm getting my righteousness down. I'm, I'm getting to heaven. No, Boneyard. God allows sin and struggle still in our life that we would lean upon grace all the more to keep us humble, to cling to the old rugged cross. No, no, Boneyard. I, I don't want to be famous. I don't want to be known, world-renowned. I don't want my name in lights. I don't want glitter. Boneyard, I need that old rugged cross with the jagged edges. I want my nails to dig deep into that old rugged cross, the stains of his blood still on that cross, still fresh for my sin. I need that old rugged cross. Boneyard, this is Paul describing every Christian's struggle as they get closer to the cross. Imagine, Boneyard, as you get closer to the cross, it illuminates how much more dirtier you are. As you walk it out in sanctification, the closer you get to a flame, the closer you get to a light, you see how dirty you are. You see more dirt as you get closer. This is what Paul was telling us here. He's not a carnal disciple. He's not a Christian who has a license to sin. Notice, if you really love Jesus, you'll keep his commandments. As we continue here in verse 16. For if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law. For it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me. This is my flesh. For I have desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Notice Boyard, he still struggles he still struggles. He knows God's commandments and his laws, but he may slip and fall. But he needs to remember also, Boneyard, what John tells us in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess with our mouth our sins, he is faithful and just to clean us, clean us from all unrighteousness. Paul is leaning upon grace just like you and me as we continue. For I do not do the good that I want. But the evil I do not want is what's keep, what I keep on doing. Boneyard, if you're here today and you're thinking, I just can't be a Christian because I keep smoking. I can't be a Christian because I, I, I sin, I, I slip up, I, I make mistakes. 
boneyard. I want you to understand there's two different types of people. And Paul is quick to point that out. The unbeliever and the believer. But the unbeliever, he wakes up in the morning and he sets his heart on sinning. How can I sin today? How can I worship myself today? How can I, how can I, how can I indulge in my sin and enjoy it? Swim in it, consume it, drink it. However, the believer wakes up. He says, Sola de glory. How can I bring you glory today? Like it says in 2 Corinthians 10 31, and everything that I do, that I'll bring you glory. How can I bring you honor? How can I set in my heart to praise your name today? Notice. There are two types of people. It's impossible to be an unaffiliated. It's impossible, impossible to be neutral. There is no Switzerland when it comes to spiritual things. You're either a slave to unrighteousness or a slave to holiness. As we continue, so I find it to be a law that I want to do what's right. Evil lies close at hand, for I delight in the law of the Lord and in my inner being. Notice the Christian delights in the law of the Lord. They want to please Him because they are redeemed by Him. Notice that the Christian, it's not a, a burden. It's not a heavy laden something that you carry. It's not something that their knees buckle under, but God gives them the strength to carry on. But I see in my members another law raging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my member. Notice, Christian, if you are fighting sin, you are fighting sin, you're swinging, you're throwing haymakers, you're repenting of your sins, and you're trusting in Jesus. That's the difference between an unbeliever and a believer. The unbeliever just rolls over. They give up. They let sin have dominion over them. Like it says in Romans 6, 14, you Christian, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies. You're throwing haymakers. You're putting your nose in the Word. You're studying God's words. You're repenting of your sins, and you're trusting in Jesus.